Hey, it's Heike, and I'm so excited that you're back here with me at the Pursue Your Spark podcast. Today's incredible guest interview will have you at the edge of your seat. But I want to know, have you thought about what the new year will bring? What will you do? Has the fear of aging stopped you in your tracks to pursue the dreams that you may have? Do you feel that age, circumstances, and where you are in life that you can't move forward, but you want to, don't know where to start? Well, friend, then this interview today is for you. You will meet Deirdre, an amazing woman that has taken life by its horns and went with it and fulfilling her dreams as we speak. You will hear about how she started rock climbing, marathon running, taught herself to swim, speak several languages, and play several instruments. And she's truly believing that if you turn off your TV and your social, you will find the time to do the things that you've been dreaming of. But before we dive into today's feature content, have you heard about the Fast and Fit Over 50 Jumpstart? There are seven essential lessons in this non-intimidating course teaching you simple intermittent fasting strategies combined with Pilates exercises that are ideal for someone starting out with intermittent fasting and Pilates exercises, and the exercises can be done anywhere. The program is designed for empty zester moms over 50 to reclaim their health, feel stronger and leaner. Why not jumpstart your health today? I'll put a link in the show note so you can get started today. Are you looking for a healthy snack that satisfies your chocolate cravings and your sweet tooth? Then look no further. Let me introduce you to Pakli. Pakli means joy in the Aztec language. And it is delicious puffed amaranth, quinoa, and millet combined into a super packed, super healthy snack. I love supporting women-owned businesses. And this business makes their grain snacks by hand. You can choose from four different flavors. White chocolate, milk chocolate, 55% bittersweet chocolate with dried blueberries and coconut nips, and a 70% dark chocolate with dried cranberries and cashews. All are gluten-free, organic, but the white chocolate is also soy-free. The 55 bittersweet and the 70% extra dark chocolate are vegan. What's not to like about this snack? You can choose from the Pakli snacks, individually packed, or the Pakli puffs, which you can sprinkle over cereal or yogurt. Very tasty and healthy addition to your meals. So enjoy this joyful snack by going to paktlifoods.com. That is P-A-K-T-L-I-F-O-O-D-S dot com and use the code Pursue Your Spark 15, all one word, and get your 15% off your first or your next purchase. Let's dive into today's feature content and find out what Deirdre has to teach us about overcoming your fears and living the life you dream of. I'm Heike Gates, a fitness and nutrition coach with 30 years of experience. I empower empty nester moms over 50 to take back their health and strength to feel vibrant in their second half of life. Right now, you're joined by thousands of empty nester moms around the world who stop dimming their light and instead ignite their spark. On this podcast, I do what I do best, taking complicated information about fitness, nutrition, and mindset strategies and breaking it down into baby steps that are simple, actionable, and reliable so you can implement them into your life. I regularly interview some of the most inspiring guests who share their honest stories on how they went from their worst to their best in life so that you know you're not 
not alone in your struggles. Join me as we redefine what aging looks and feels like by taking action and saying, yes, I can. This is the Pursue Your Spark Podcast. Hello, everybody. Today's guest, Deirdre Walnick, is an author, mother, professor, marathoner, musician, and climber. Deirdre is originally from New York City. She has taught five foreign languages on three continents for 44 years. Her writing in books and magazines worldwide has won awards, and her independent publishing company produced several award winners and international sellers. At 55, she began running and has done marathons, half marathons, and other races. At 59, she began rock climbing. And at 66, she became the oldest woman to climb Yosemite's El Capitan, the iconic 3,200-foot granite wall in Yosemite National Park. In 2021, she celebrated her 70th birthday by going to what's known as El Cap, again, and camping on the summit. Deirdre has just returned from a three-country speaking tour in Europe, and in 2023, the documentary about her life, Climbing Into Life, will be featured at films, fest, film festivals across the country. Welcome to the show, Deirdre. Mm-mm, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Some people may know you or heard about you because your son Alex is very well known as, and, and has an award-winning, an Oscar-winning documentary called Free Solo, where he climbed what you climbed without a rope. And so we'll talk about what this climbing is with a rope, without the rope, and what this all means to non-climbers. And when we first connected, you told me about Alex's um, free solo documentary. And I was like super excited because I had seen it and I have been used to be a climber. So I know about all this. I didn't climb anything that complicated, but at least... I was like, oh, that's the mom behind the face. But since our our show is about women over 50, 60 and beyond, we're focusing more on the woman behind the scene. And this is you. You That's me. (laughs) What is one of your strengths, Zira? One of my strengths, I would have to say tenacity. (laughs) Stick-to-itiveness. Okay. All right. When did you notice that you had that strength? Oh, I've always been like that. Always like that. So going back to, we we had this amazing introduction about so much to unpack. You're from New York City. Mm -hmm. Tell us about who you were as a child so people can picture who you are. Well, I was very, very different then than I am now. Very different. My mother was handicapped and I, I was supposed to stay home to, you know, not take care of her, but help her. I was her arms and legs, if you will. And um, so I was very quiet. I stayed home a lot. I didn't have a whole lot of friends because I was always home. Um, I I developed uh, uh, more cerebral outlets for my passions. You know, I was a musician. I played piano, a lot of instruments. Um, I used to write, you know, as far back as like first grade, second grade, I was always writing. And, um, so I was very, very different. I never really moved into the physical outdoor world until recently. Mm-hmm. Now, do you you have any brothers and sisters? I have an older brother. Okay. And is he still anywhere near close to you? Does he do what you do? Or who is he? No, he, he doesn't uh, do any of the outdoor stuff, um, but, he, but he does ski every winter, which is okay. definitely outdoor. Um, he's in the San Diego area. Oh, fun. Very cool. So you get to see him more often. Once in a while. It's like 700 miles from my house. <laughs> so not that often. <laughs> okay. I just, got, I just got back from there this week, in fact. Yeah. So where do you live now? In Sacramento, the Sacramento area. Sacramento. Sacramento area. How cool. So one brother, you're at home with taking care of the family. You're learning how many languages? How many? Well, no, you- no. Uh, uh, back then in New York City, uh, this is after World War II, um, the city was overrun with immigrants, you know, refugees, people escaping the war. And and then they all had kids. And, and so I grew up, 
grew up using lots of languages. It was a wonderful way to grow up. Um, you know, I went to my friend Teresa's house. So I had to be sociable with the grandparents and, you know, be respectful in Slovak. And when I went to Los Andres house, I had to use a, a little bit of Italian. So that was my world. And so now it, I think I'm working on number nine right now. Five so you, years. so give me how many? So Italian, Slovak, English? But, well, no, I don't know Slovak. I, I, that was gone long, long time ago. Uh, okay. French, uh, French, Spanish, Italian, and Japanese were kind of fluent. I mean, French, Spanish, Italian were fluent, totally. Japanese kind of, like house Japanese, you know, mom Japanese. I could sp speak it just fine. And then I speak enough uh, German and it, uh, what else? Polish. Uh, Polish was in the family. It's a, it's a Polish-American family. And um, Greek. Uh, Greek is my latest because I've been traveling through Greece quite a bit. I saw this on your Instagram. I'm, yeah. I'm following you. It's like, where is it? It's like, not where is like, like Waldo. Waldo. <laughs> no, where's Deidre this week? <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a, a wonderful, rich life that has translated out of what you started with your fitness. That is that is just amazing. And and meeting all these fun and interesting people and learning mm -hmm. about them. Now, mm -hmm. um, you also play instruments. Yes. Yes, I've, I've always been uh, a musician, a performing musician all my life. I play piano and anything that has a keyboard, you know, like accordion or xylophone or whatever, organ. I, I used to play at the school graduations when I was teaching high school. Up in the loft, I play the organ. Um, I play guitar, I play flute, um, a lot of instruments. And that kind of arose from growing up in New York City. I used to go see all the greats in Central Park and in Lincoln Center and, and you know, all that. Um, and I always wanted to conduct an, an orchestra, but I knew way back then, I knew that you had to have credentials to do that. You know, you had to, had to have an invitation from somebody important. But as it turned out, you don't. Because <laughs> back in 1990, I uh, created a, my own orchestra in, in West Sacramento, which was not a city yet back then. It was a little burg an offshoot of Sacramento. There was nothing there. And uh, I didn't want to raise my kids that way in a place that had no culture of any kind. So I created the, the West Sacramento Community Orchestra and uh, I conducted that for four years, I think, yeah, four, four and a half years. How do you teach yourself to conduct? Well, I watched all these greats all those years, you know, in the park and in, in Lincoln Center and concerts all over the city. New York City is amazing for that. You, whatever interests you, it's there. It's page, you know, it's there all over the place. So I went to a lot of concerts. I watched them very carefully. And of course, I played in the school orchestra in high school. And uh, and I, I've always performed on the piano and and other other instruments you know, like family weddings things like that and and little local orchestras i play the flute or clarinet um so i watched very carefully I, i'm an observer and um you can learn a lot just by watching the greats you know just by watching or copying you know copying like copying the masters if you want to learn how to paint one of the best ways because i paint as well and I went through many years where I, I copied all the masters, you know, and it's a wonderful way to learn about mixing colors, about how to apply the paint, you know, so whatever you want to do in life, and, and it's never too late. I mean, a lot of this stuff I learned later in life, mm -hmm. whatever you want to do in life, it's out there, it's available, you have the sum of human knowledge at your fingertips on a computer, whatever interests you, you can learn it and and you should. <laughs> you should get out there and, you know, follow your your dream, your bliss, whatever you want to call that, because uh, it's very rewarding. You know, somebody listening to this might say, yeah, you got all yeah. the time in the world over there, Deidre. I don't have no, that I did much not. time. <laughs> I did not. I did not. When I was doing the orchestra, I was working full time. I, actually, I was working, teaching at college, teaching college more than full time. I had two children. I had a failing marriage. I, we were going through a divorce. Um, and I, I was also teaching part time. Yeah. And I was also writing. So, no, I don't believe that for one second that you don't have enough time. I, I didn't either. I didn't have enough time to, to train to go run marathons either. Nonetheless, if you want to do it enough, you will carve out the time. You will make the time, you know, if you want to badly enough.
Yeah, I agree with that. And I was like, because that's what I oftentimes hear is like, oh, yeah, it's you. Yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, I just really want it that much that I'm going right, to right, make right. that time, just like you said. Right. Turn off the thing. Television is a mind waster and a time waster. Turn off the, the computer, the, the, uh, the what do you call it, the social media. That's a time waster, a extravagant time waster. We don't realize. We go online and next thing we know, it's two hours later. You know, it's a time waster. Um, turn all that stuff off. When, when, when we had children, I decided, well, both of us decided that um, we would not have a television in the house. And so they grew up without it. And I mean, there was one, a little one in our bedroom just in case we needed it. But, you know, it wasn't part of our life, mm-hmm. especially not our social life. You know, I've been in many houses where the kids, kids all get there and they all pop themselves in front of the television. And that's what they do. That's yeah. not doing. That's not doing. That's avoiding doing. Mm-hmm. You want to get out and do stuff, you know, turn all that stuff off. Don't make it an option. It's. I, yeah, that really saddens me greatly that people just accept that, that they have to have a television. When people come to my door and, you know, solicitors and, uh, uh, for one streaming system or, or TV system or another, they say, you know, which system do you use? And I say, I don't have television. They don't even understand what I mean. <laughs> you know, they really don't. I have to explain. No, there's no, there's no piece of furniture or a box or whatever you, you know, I don't have that. Mm-hmm. No, you know, they, that does not compete with people. And there's so little of value worth watching. <laughs> I mean, there's so little of value on television that, you know, don't let it steal your life. That's, that's, that's the message. I mean, don't let it steal your life because it will very easily. Very easily. And, you know, I hear that, too, from some of my clients that say, I just don't have the time. And I go yeah, back right. and ask, how much right. time do you spend scrolling? Yes. How much time do you spend just flipping from channel to channel? Right, right. And But we've been, and that's a good point, we've been really indoctrinated yes. with this yeah, is yeah. part of our, it has to be. Brainwashed. We have been brainwashed to believe that you have to have a television. Yeah. It's, your life is empty without it. Yeah, you know, your life is empty with it. I'm sorry. Because otherwise, Deirdre wouldn't be doing all those amazing things. That's, it. Yeah. That's exactly right. I would not have time. Exactly. Because <laughs> then you, you would sit at home, knit or whatever you would do, and maybe painting some, watching a show, mm-hmm. but you're not. Mm-hmm. And then it's a good example of uh, grabbing life by the horns. Yeah. And, and doing what you want to do, because you also, you learn to swim in your 40s. Right, right. When we bought this house, it had a pool and I had little children. And so I said, OK, well, I have to know how to do this. You know, if my kids, little children are going to be out there. Uh, I want to be capable, you know, and uh, and I always envied people who could swim. I grew up in New York City. There were no pools around. If you went to the ocean, it was waves crashing on you you couldn't learn to swim that way you know so i just i just never learned to swim it was never part of my high school or anything mm-hmm. so so i every, every day i went out there in the afternoon and taught myself how to swim with how did you learn how did you know the strokes or, or, or well, how did- I, I had watched people all my life i knew what they did you know okay, okay. My, my big issue is breathing um my biggest issue is breathing, whether it's in water or air. That's my or air. Because my lungs are shot. My parents, both of my parents smoked all the time. And so our house was a, a cloud of gray smoke all the time. Mm. So my lungs are really shot. So, you know, I knew what to do. I, I just had never done it. You know, so I just had to teach myself how to practice. You know, I learned swimming seven years ago. Good for you. Oh, Good I'm 61. You. Good for you. Uh, and I did. I was in a competition for a duathlon, and I won the uh, the entrance to the world championships. Really? In Milwaukee, and it was okay. I had to learn to swim in order to compete there. And my yes. husband said, "You know that, right?" And I was like, "Hmm, okay, I can do this." So I took. <laughs> I hired a coach, and I said, "Because I only know breaststroke." I was like, "Yeah, I don't yeah, know. I can't yeah. breaststroke for a whatever." <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so I took lessons. And like you said, the breathing, it was like the breathing was the hardest, even though I'm a Pilates yes. teacher and all about breath, mm-hmm. but having the face in the water and having to yeah. do bubbles and do mm-hmm. all this. But mm-hmm. I said, I'm going to do that. And I ended up doing an Ironman because of it. 
Good for you. Well, oh, thank you. There's a but, lesson in there for everybody. Yeah. yeah listen up, everybody. We have tons of lessons. So we're moving on from the swimming. So now by now, you know that Deidre is about getting outside the comfort zone. Yes. Why do you think it's important to get outside of your comfort zone, Deidre? That's that's where life happens. That's where adventure happens. That's where you find out what you can do. I mean, in normal, ordinary home drum life, whatever you want to call that, we're never pushed to find out our limits in anything, really, you know? And, and that's a scary thing when you start to find your limits. And you, you know, to get outside of your comfort zone, you have to, you have to make friends with fear in all its forms. And, and it's, yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've lost sight of your actual question. What did you ask me? <laughs> Don't worry. It's about the comfort zone. You're now how do you comfort, comfort zone? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the only way to get out there is the only way to do that is to challenge yourself. Do yeah. things that you don't normally do. Yeah. Or that scare you, you know? I mean, everybody says, oh, I could never do that. I could never be a rock climber. I'm afraid of heights. That is not true. Everybody, anybody with half a brain is afraid of heights, but it's not the height that they're afraid of. It's falling off. Mm -hmm. And when you have a rope on and you know you can't fall off, you can start to push yourself because you know that that consequence is off the table. You're not going to fall. You might you know, fall a few feet onto okay. the rope. You might bang your elbow, but you're not going to fall and die. And once once your brain and, and your mind, whatever you want to call that, really accept that, then your comfort zone gets a little bigger. And then you can start challenging yourself a little bit more. It's it's an it's a fascinating process, you know, especially coming at it in old age, if you will. I mean, I didn't start any of this stuff until I was, in my son's view, an old lady. You know, how old were you then? Um, well, I started climbing at fifty nine. I didn't, I didn't really go outdoors until my sixties with my friends. Because you were running a marathon at fifty five, or started yeah. running. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want to I want to tie back a little bit to your two kids because they're a big part of your story yeah. is you have a son, Alex, and the daughter, Stasia. 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 Yeah. Tell me about them. Well, Stasia was first. She was born in Japan. And then two years later, when we moved back here, Alex was born. Um, they're both adventurers. Um, I guess uh, we encouraged that and we used to take them outdoors. We go camping a lot and we, you know, exa explore the outdoor world, which is what humans come from. You know, the outdoor world is us. And, and when you live in a city, you lose sight of that. But we kind of lived in a city. Sacramento is a small city, but um, it's close to a lot of outdoor activities and, and the mountains, the Sierra Nevada is, you know, 60 miles away. And, and so we, we did a lot of that and they both turned out and we, uh, again, we didn't have television, so they didn't spend hours on a screen and we didn't have computers and, and phones or anything back then. And so they didn't have all those screens to distract them and to make them lazy, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so they were accustomed to going out and doing stuff, you know, and boy, do they do stuff. My, my daughter's a long distance runner and a long distance biker. And she and her partner, James, have just finished biking across the country, 3,000 miles. Oh, cool. No support, nothing. They, the, just the two of them biking with their camping stuff on their bikes. They camped all the way. How long did it take them? Three. They took three months because they stopped here and there, you know, to explore. Yeah, yeah. But it took three months, and it was an amazing adventure. And then, and yeah, so they're both adventurers, and they they've both taught me a lot about how to, you know, how to what's the world to remake your life the way mm -hmm. you want it, you know, the way you want it, and. And, and that, of course, involves the outdoors because the outdoors are us. You know, we are nature is our mother. You know, mother nature, that's not just a phrase. I mean, nature is our mother. That's where we come from. And, and that's where we heal. You know, just taking a walk through a green park in your neighborhood can make you feel so better, so much better, so more relaxed. And and it's 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 amazing how much good the time in nature can do for us. And people just ignore it. And that's so sad. Yep. I couldn't agree more with you. I'm an outdoor person too. 
Any chance I can get, I'm going outside. Right now, my son, wife, and granddaughter are visiting from Amsterdam. Oh, nice. And anytime the weather is somewhat decent, I'll pack her up, and we're in the stroller. We're out heading to the next playground. I mean, she can't do much because she's 11, but she can still do, you know, she can walk a little bit with her hand. Mm -hmm. And we're always outdoors because I I truly believe that too. That nature is so so important, and we're yeah. you're stuck inside so much and don't take right. advantage right. of that. Right. And we don't have to do anything drastic or dramatic like we're no. talking about today. I mean, just a simple walk in the park is amazing. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah, just tell just me, get out there. Yeah. Tell anyway. me about. Tell me about your first run, because I've been, of course, reinvestigating you, as I told you. Tell me about the first run. I like them. Good. Well, first run, uh, that's quite a story. Um, but I, I'm assuming you mean my first organized run out there, uh -huh. where, where it was measured. Well, I heard something about a dog and a flannel shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I heard that somewhere. Well, we had, we had a big dog, and uh, I was going through a horrible period of like five, six, seven years where people were dying People were dying, and I wound up with several houses to take care of alone, wow. three of which were on the East Coast. And I had to remodel them by long distance while teaching here in California. It was horrible. Mm. And so all day long, I was at the college. I, I would teach. I come home, change my clothes, go in the office in our, you know, our fourth bedroom was my office. And I would do all the estate work. My husband had just, I had just divorced him, and that same month he died, just dropped oh. dead. And um, the, it, the amount of paperwork was quite incredible. And I didn't have any help. I didn't have any time to even think about going out and finding help. I didn't know who I needed, what I needed. I just had to sit in there and do it. And so I did that every day for almost two years. I worked from like 5.30 in the morning till like 10 or 11 at night, nonstop. And then I would take the dog out for a walk to clear my head. And it was a Malamute. That's a and she was very powerful and, you know, long legs. And I had this, you know, breathing issue that I've always had. Um, so I, I knew, I knew, quote unquote, that I couldn't run with her, but, but I would try to keep up with her. <laughs> and uh, one night I came home and, and I burst through the door and I said, to, I yelled, Alex, Alex, he was home. He, he was not living at home then, but he was then, home then to replenish his van stock, you know from my refrigerator and so he's on so so i'm like oh no i just ran a mile to me that was everest i had climbed everest i knew i couldn't run i couldn't breathe worth the darn getting up out of my chair and i would huff and puff so i knew this was impossible and i had just run a mile with the dog i was absolutely ecstatic yeah exactly and he comes down the hall munching his cookie saying oh Way to go, mom. Uh, you know, cool. If you can do a mile, you can do a mile and a half. That's uh, what I'm saying. <laughs> I was absolutely, what's the word? Uh, D, you know, you know the word I'm looking for. Abergasted. I was, I was undone, totally undone. I had climbed Everest and he wasn't the slightest bit impressed. <laughs> and, and, but I realized at the same time that he was right. If you can run a mile, you can run a mile and a quarter. You can run a mile and two houses you know, whatever. And so I started testing that. And that's what I meant before about your comfort zone. I had no comfort zone when, when it came to running. I couldn't do it, period, end of story. Mm -hmm. But what he said was absolutely true. And so I started testing it, pushing the limits, pushing the limits. And within, I don't know, six months, I, yeah, maybe four months, I I found out about the run to feed the hungry, you know, for Thanksgiving helps yep. the food closet. And it's immense here in Sacramento, like 20,000 people come out for this run. I had no idea. And so I, I told Alex, I'm going to sign up for this. And he said, well, sign me up too. I'll go with you. And so he did. And he, the night before the run, he came back from Spain where he had been competing in climbing competitions. And I'm thinking, okay, he just got back from Spain. He's got to be exhausted, you know. No, he got up and went with me. And uh, I had my jeans on and my flannel shirt. And I had no clue how to be a runner. I just was running with the dog. That's all. I had no, no friends to, you know, tell me how to do it, what you should wear, nothing. I just, I was ignorant. And so I went with him to this race. And there's these 20,000 people. 
and, and television and radio. They're all there and they're all wearing spandex and costumes. And, and I have my jeans with the big buckle and my you know, flannel. <laughs> but I did that race. It was a 6.2 miles, which is absolutely absurd for somebody who can't breathe. But I had, like I said, about, I think it was about four months. I had just you know, pushing that limit little by little by little. And baby steps is all it takes. That's all I did was, you know, one, the next day I do a, another block. The day, two days later, I do another block. That's all. Baby steps. And I I did that 6.2 mile run. It was, a you know, t- 10K. Yeah, 10K. And um, and the only, the only reason I got through it really, I mean, I, I was almost able myself, but I still didn't have everything it would have taken. But my son had just gotten back from Spain. He ran next to me. He ran in circles around me and ran backwards in front of me, telling me about his adventures in Spain. And if it hadn't been for that voice that I followed for those six points for a while, I might not have finished. I don't know. I don't know if I would have dug deep enough to find what I needed to finish, but but he sure helped. <laughs> that is fantastic. And, you know, I think this is a very good story for the listeners to say you don't need to wear spandex. You don't. And some people or some no, women just no, don't no. want to wear those tight little outfitsies. Yeah, and people say that I can't do X, Y, Z sport because it's too expensive. None of the sports are expensive if you yeah. do it that way, you know, yeah. and, and they can be very expensive if you want the, the beautiful costume and the special water bottle and the, the belt. And, you, know, you could do it without all that stuff. Yep. Yep. I love it that he ran circles around you, which brings me a little yeah. bit to Alex, <laughs> too, because we <laughs> I can just picture it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Tell us about Alex. You told us about Stacia. Tell us about Alex. Well, Alex was a climber from birth. That's all he ever wanted to do. He was born to climb. He had huge hands. He had powerful legs the day he was born. The day he was born, he could stand up, which is completely unheard of. And people don't believe me, but I'm telling them, you know, gospel truth here. The day, if you let him hold on to your little fingers like babies grasp all the time, you know, if you let him, if he could grasp your little fingers on your lap, he would stand up. And he couldn't stay that way, but he could get vertical. Because he had powerful thighs and he had these huge hands. And the first thing everybody, all the neighbors, when they started to come in to see the baby, they'd all look at, down in the little basket and everybody, to a person, everybody said the same thing. Not, oh, how cute. Oh, how it looks just like mom. Oh, it looks just like that. None of that. Oh, what big hands he has. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing everybody said. So he, he was born to climb, you know. No doubt about that. And so that's all we ever wanted to do. Buildings, the school, the trees, whatever. Grandma's shelves in the garage, whatever. He just wanted to go higher all the time. It was made it made him a very, very hard kid to raise. I can imagine. Very hard. It's also probably very scary when I think about, you know, the, all the things that I know from the documentary, how he yeah. got there. I was so little. And every, he climbs everything without a rope. No, no, he, no. Uh, ropeless climbing takes up about 1% of his climbing. 1%, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which but, is, but you know, you, you climb up really high, but there's nothing like you explained earlier that would catch you. It's like if you right. go down, you go down. Well, if you fall while free soloing, it's all over. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And that has happened to him, I think, once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did take a fall once and fortunately landed, hit a but you know the big like tree like bush was sticking out of the wall that slowed him and then he hit a ledge and didn't go any further than that thank goodness yeah it's scary which brings us now to you so you run you do these races you know you got this you speak all these languages you do all this cool stuff and you're like one day you wake up and you said why don't i climb is that how it went not exactly no <laughs> Um, I had no intentions of ever climbing. I, it scared the bejeebers out of me. But um, it was my son's entire world. And he would come home from an expedition and he'd tell me what they had done. When I had, didn't understand any of it. Climbing is a jargon, a very complete language, a jargon all of its own. And I wouldn't understand. And he'd explain things to me, you know, what this gear did, you know, how to use this thing. But, but 
not doing it myself, I didn't get it. I didn't understand what he was talking about. And his friends would come over and they'd all sit around talking about what their next expedition or their recent next. And I, it was like a foreign language. And, and that put, put up a wall between us. You know, we couldn't really talk deeply together about anything because that was his whole life. And so I wanted to try it just, I, want, I wanted to experience it once at the gym, just so I could see what the, all this gear does, how you use it. When he's talking about this and that, what does it mean? You know, so I had him take me to the gym, the climbing gym here in town. And he showed me how to tie in and, and I expected, my expectation was that I would climb a half a wall because as I knew, just like I knew I couldn't run, I was afraid of heights because I've been up in many skyscrapers in New York City. And I knew that if I looked out over the edge, you know, my stomach would roil. And I, yeah, everybody knows that feeling, you know. And so I knew, quote unquote, that I was afraid of heights. But as I explained before, you're not afraid of the height itself. You're afraid of falling off. So once I got tied in, I put that rope on and I felt and I had the strongest belayer in the world on the other end of my rope. And I knew that. And I knew that he could handle anything, any stupidity that I might do. I knew he could handle it. Um, so I started going up the wall and I wound up climbing the whole wall and it was exciting and I loved it. And I looked down and I was not afraid to look down. I figured I would be. And then I wound up, I did like 12 climbs that day, which is, which is a lot, which is extraordinary. Hands and, off. Yeah, Hands yeah, are hurting. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And um, and then he left on another expedition off to Borneo, I think, Borneo or Siberia, one of those. And um, I was home alone and thinking about that. And I wanted to go back, but I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know how to attach the stupid harness. The harness is not intuitive. <laughs> oh. And so it took me months and, you know, about, about a couple of months. And I finally got up the courage to go back by myself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I started making friends and they started taking, teaching me stuff and taking me outdoors and, and just kind of developed. The climbing community is a very friendly community from what, and I, I shared with you that I used to rock yeah. with my son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He uh, was going to the climbing local gym, climbing gym here in Maryland and I had to drive him there. So I was most parents just sat around and I'm like, why would I sit around? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I can learn how to boulder, you know, uh -huh. and to help the listeners. When Deidre went up on the wall, you have to wear a harness because the harness is attached to a ring on top of the wall, which then goes down to the person which you mentioned, ballet. It's like the Relax. person that holds you basically on the rope. Mm -hmm. They make sure that that you have enough slack on the rope, that it's mm -hmm. tight enough. That and, that it, and, and especially if you fall, they... They got Take up all the slack so that you don't fall far. Yeah. Yep. And so that's your safety person down there. And it's a right. really important function. Yes. And then there's the other version of climbing, which uh, part of what Alex does, which is form of bouldering where you have no harness, no rope, and you just use your body, your body's balance and your hand strength, your hip mobility, especially for us women and your leg strength to crawl up and climb up those mountains or those, those mm -hmm. Uh, man-made boulders, boulders either yeah. inside or uh, especially inside and you have these little nobbins where you hold with your hands mm -hmm. and this requires a lot of strength balance and flexibility mm -hmm. and so if you've never climbed so you have an idea of what that would look like and that Deirdre went up 12 times boy that's hard just that saying <laughs> it is yeah, it was I was sore afterwards the next day my hands hurt my forearms burned you know yeah yep and so then you said this is great i have this new community i want to climb a mountain so what was the next progression until you well, get to el cap well i didn't start with a mountain and my friends started taking me outdoors there's all kinds of um river gorges around um in the foothills of the sierra nevada and it's not far from here so that we would do that for a day you know go out and call it cragging you go out to the crag and just go up and down and up and down yep. all day and then after a few months of that they decided they'd take me to do a multi-pitch climb which means that you go up and you don't come down you go up from that one and then you go up more and then you go up more and and uh, that's that's a different kind of climbing altogether it's a different mindset and totally different fear level 
because okay. you're up there and you're up there and you're not coming down. You're going up more. And it, it's, it was terrifying the first time. Absolutely terrifying. I was paralyzed with fear when we got to that first level, the first uh, ledge where the first anchor was. I, I you know, mantled up, uh, I pushed myself up and turned around, sat down on the ledge and I looked down and I was absolutely paralyzed with fear. I couldn't do anything. And and all my friends were bouncing around this. It was a huge ledge. They're bouncing around, moving ropes, and moving gear. And they're like, here, here, dear, to hold this. And I said, oh, I can't. I can't. I, I, I couldn't do anything. But when they got all ready to do the second pitch, the second rope length up from there, I, I rallied. I talked, I talked myself out of that. And, you know, that, you know, th there are two different kinds of fear in life. Um, one is real fear where, where you're in real danger. And the other one is perceived fear where we think we're in danger, but we're really not. I was in no danger up there, but I was afraid of being that high. I was, I was afraid because I didn't yet understand fully what all the gear did and how to use it. You know, I was still ignorant. Uh, all these things make you afraid, but there's really no reason to be afraid because you're totally safe. I was safe. I knew that. I knew I was safe. You know, they're bouncing around without their harnesses up there. You know, you know, they, they took them off to, to have lunch or whatever. And so I, I knew I mean, I had to fight those two levels, the two kinds of fear, you know, and I, I had to talk myself out of the perceived fear and tell myself, okay, well, they're going up. I have to go with them because <laughs> you can't just turn around and go down. You know, they got to have ropes and partners. So um, I went with them and it was amazing. It was just amazing. Are you looking for the perfect snack that is ideal for a woman on the go? It's wholesome and it's tasty and it helps you satisfy your sweet tooth or any chocolate cravings. Then look no further. Here is Pakli. Pakli is made by a woman-owned business and Pakli puffs are loaded with amaranth, quinoa and millet. So it is the ideal superfood. Pakli is handmade and with a traditional Mexican method of making alegrías. There are four flavors to choose from. White chocolate, milk chocolate, 55% bittersweet chocolate with dried blueberries and cacao nips, and a 70% dark chocolate with dried cranberries and cashews. All gluten-free, organic, and all but the white are soy-free as well. The bittersweet and the 70% extra dark chocolate are also vegan. You can choose from the Puckley snacks that are individually wrapped or the Puckley puffs, which you can simply add to your cereal, eat it out of the bag, or sprinkle it over your cereal. Puckley snacks are a unique, healthy, and delicious quick snack that will bring you joy and put a smile on your face. The combination of chocolate and puffed grain satisfied the need for something crunchy and delicious. Order your own Puckley snack today by going to PuckleyFoods.com and that is P-A-K-T-L-I-F-O-O-D-S dot com. Use the code PursueYourSpark15 all in one word, getting 15% off your order of yummy, crunchy deliciousness. Yeah, the climbing that Deidre describes right now is like you heard us the first part was you climb up a wall, you come back down. When you do multiple uh, climbs back to back, you have somebody that is the lead and they they have a lead rope that they hook into existing or they hammer depending on what. No, 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 no more. Yeah. No more? No. So how do you get to the second part then? Is uh, simply supporting each other? No, um, no, no. Um... This was traditional climbing, which means you use gear yep. that, that you put into a little crack in the rock and it expands and that will hold you or you, you tie it around something that's up there, you know, a, a horn, they call it a, a rock. Uh -huh. um, and, and then you make the anchors yourself. There's no anchors up there. So in the Sierra Nevada, it's mostly trad climbing, traditional climbing, where you take the gear, you put it in. And then the person who comes up behind you takes it out, puts yeah. it back on their harness. So that's what we were doing. We were doing traditional climbing. 
Yeah. So for those, I don't know how many people know that much about climbing or want to know super duper details. I think they want to yeah. know more. What happened next? Well, so, I got to the top. Got to the top. And got I to the top. Excited. Yeah, I'm quite excited that I had talked myself through it, as it were. And, and son of God, there really was nothing to be afraid of because all my friends that day knew what they were doing. I didn't so much, but I trusted them, you know, and there's a, a lot of trust involved in climbing. You have to really trust your partner because your life is in their hands and vice versa. And I knew that I wasn't experienced enough to, to, to belay for anybody that day. You know, they wouldn't let me and rightly so, you know, cause I wasn't experienced enough, yeah. but I am now. <laughs> so, so then w- when was the decision made that you climb El Cap? And I think the first time you did it with Alex, is that right? Yeah, that was, that that was years later, <laughs> years later, maybe nine years Which later. Which means, no, how, did years you later. Pre- how did you prepare to get to that point? What was your Well, I, I climbed every year you know, with my friends, and once in a while with my son. And my son took me, uh, actually, can, can you see the photos behind me? Yeah. All of those photos are the, the peaks that I did with my son. And um. they're all in Yosemite. Okay. In Yosemite. And they're extraordinary peaks. They're huge. They're far from, you know, the car. Um, but they're not very difficult in terms of climbing. You know, I could climb them and he knew where to go. He knew where to take me because he knows everything out there. You know, he, it's the, like the back of his hand. So um, I did all these climbs and, uh, and I was getting more and more experience and more and more um, knowledgeable about um what do you call it, uh, strategy and, and how to do it, you know. That's not the word I'm looking for, but it'll come. Um, and so they were making this movie about El Cap, and I didn't know. Um, I didn't know he was going to free solo it. You know, no, no free soloist ever tells anyone that they're going to do that because their mind has to be totally clear to do that. Um, so when I found out afterwards, I was like, huh. Oh, Okay. If he could do that, I wonder if maybe he could get me, you know, lead me up that wall. Because we had done another climb, I think it's right back here. This one. We had done this climb. It's called um, Royal Arches. And it's on the same side of the valley. The Yosemite Valley is a very long valley. And all these huge monstrous walls you know, line it on both sides. And it's on the same side, same same wall, basically, as El Capitan. And we did that in okay time. We did it like up and down at like nine o'clock in the morning till dinner time. Yeah. Uh, and it's very, very long. It's 16 pitches, 15 pitches. And um, 15, you know, rope, total rope lengths. And, and I followed him up it like a little puppy. He says, we go, we go. You know, I just follow him around. And But when you go with Alex, you go really fast. Because, you know, he holds all the speed records on everything. And he won't ever, you know, like sleep on the wall. That's just too much work. You have to carry all that water. You have to carry all that stuff. So he just goes up and down. You sleep in your own bed. I didn't realize that was, I didn't realize that was unusual. It was the, maybe you didn't realize there was the plan when you went. You're like, wait a minute. So, so, yeah. So I asked him one day when he was coming through my house, you know, restocking his van again. I asked him if someday you might, you know, lead me up El Cap. And I really didn't expect him to say yes because of how I climb. I'm not a very good climber. I never will be. I started late. I'm not, you know, I don't have the arm strength and all that stuff. And I don't do it as often as you would need to to get really good. Mm -hmm. Um, So I didn't really expect him to say, but he said, yeah, sure. But you have to learn how to jug. Now, jugging is using those metal handles that clip onto the rope to, to climb the rope, basically. Your feet are on the wall for ballast, for balance, but your hands are on the rope on these things, on these gizmos called jumars. Mm -hmm. And um, he said that, and then he left on another expedition. And so I started asking all of my friends, what's a jumar? What's a jug? You know, and they, they, some of them knew. And I went online, you know, like I said, the sum of human knowledge is, is at our fingertips here online. And so I found out all about it and I found out who had them and I got myself a pair and started training. And I trained for 18 weeks okay. to do that. And, and fortunately, we had friends who are rangers in the valley. So they have a house and I could stay in their house. Mm-hmm. So I had a kitchen, I had a bed, you know, that's a bathroom. 
And so I went for 18 weeks, three days a week. I would stay three days. First day I would do cardio, you know, big, big high hikes on the sides of those walls. And the other two days I would go up. There are lots of fixed ropes that are always hanging on the sides of some of these cliffs. And there, there are two sets of these on El Capitan. So I actually practiced on El Cap. And uh, I did 18 weeks of that nonstop. And I, and I figured 18 weeks, that's what I did for a living. Our semester was 18 weeks. And in 18 weeks, you can master a little French or a little math or a little science or whatever you want to learn, right? You can take a course. So I figured 18 weeks would get me there. And uh, it did. It was just enough. I had just trained enough to do it and come down in a day, which is extraordinary. I didn't realize then how extraordinary that is. I found out later the people who first did that climb that we did took four days. Wow. And, and that's normal for that route that we did. Mm -hmm. um, and then I came down and I went to bed like at two in the morning that night. And uh, next morning, like eight or nine, I got up and I was absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. I, that was a big surprise. So apparently I had trained just enough. <laughs> Because you would assume that when you hear that, okay, uh, people usually take four uh, four days to do what we did in one day. Right. You must have been crazy sore, hands falling off, water yeah, yeah. on fire, yeah. neck yeah. burning, or whatever I, else. I was during it. I was during the climb. Mm -hmm. But I had trained enough so that my body could recover enough, and and that's all it took. Coming it down, have... coming down was harder than going up. But not on the arms and the hands and the upper body. It was harder on the head. It was more scary than going up. And uh, on the, you know, my lower half, my, my brakes, you know, because it's all very steep. Yeah. 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 It, you know what? This is, this is just such a feeling of, of, think of pride that you must have felt afterwards about what you just had done. Not pride exactly, but satisfaction. You know, I had learn how to do it. I had taught myself everything I needed to know. I uh -huh. had trained, trained for enough time. And, you know, I had figured it all out alone, you know, myself. Mm -hmm. and, and then I went and did it. And immense satisfaction comes from that. Immense. Yeah. So what came after El Cap? Well, after El Cap, I had uh, surgery on my foot, massive surgery on my left foot. And um, basically it was ripped apart and put back together with a lot of titanium. And uh, um, so I was down for like a year okay. and, then, and then COVID hit. And uh, so there, there was like four years where I didn't do anything, mm -hmm. nothing at all. I, I couldn't, you know, Mark couldn't get together with my friends and, you know, we couldn't go out to eat COVID, COVID, COVID. Yeah. And my 70th birthday was coming up during COVID and, and I you know, couldn't go to a restaurant with everybody. Couldn't have a party at my house, you know. <laughs> so what do I want to do? Far, you know? For sure. Yeah, yeah. So I thought to myself, I want to find, after the surgery and the surgery, all the limping from the surgery that whole year through up my other knee, knee on my other side. And so I'm, I'm working with a lot of deficits right now, physical deficits. And I wanted to find out if I still could do it. And, but I didn't have a partner. You know, Alex wasn't around. He was in Europe or something. And I wanted, I didn't, I didn't want to do it alone, obviously. But the descent route, you know, the way everybody, there are 105 climbs routes that climb up El Cap. Everybody who goes up any of those 105 routes comes down the same way. And it's called the descent route. And there are, um, uh, what do you call, uh, fixed ropes in the middle where it's really vertical. There are fixed ropes, six fixed ropes in the middle. The top is oh, so scary. And the bottom is scrambling through woods and over boulders. And it's very, very demanding physically. Mm -hmm. But I knew I could do it because I had come down that way with my son. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, so I decided to go up that way. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, like I said, we did it in one day up and down. We got down by two in the morning. Um, so I hadn't slept on the wall and I had spent many years with the kids without the kids standing in in El Cap, uh, El, El Cap uh, Meadow looking up at the headlamps you know the, watching the little lights go up and as night falls you could see them setting up camp up there on those portal ledges you know where they sleep on the wall I always wanted to try sleeping up there 
mm-hmm. and not always, but, but as a climber, you know, in my climbing life. And but I didn't with Alex, so I decided to climb El Cap, take the the descent route up El Cap, because you can do it in either direction, and then camp up on the top. So mm-hmm. that's what we did. I had a whole. There were eleven of us who went up. Oh, how fun! Me and ten friends, and and uh, and we all camped on top. It was amazing. How fun! And what a great way to celebrate your seventieth birthday. Oh, I will never top that as a birthday party. Never. <laughs> 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 that is amazing. Are there any favorite spots aside from that place that you like to climb? Oh, so many. <laughs> oh, so okay. many. I want to go back. I just this summer, this when this fall, I was in uh, um, it, it northern Italy and Switzerland, the Italian part of Switzerland, which is in the Alps, and I and in Greece, and I was climbing it all this. But I want really want to go back to the Dolomites in northeastern Italy. Yep. You know, between Italy and uh, Austria, Italy and Switzerland. Yeah. So beautiful. And the climbing is what I, the kind I love, because rock is different everywhere you go, totally different. And um, I don't have a whole lot of experience, vast like my son, but I've experienced many different kinds of rocks. And the Dolomites are me. You know, there are there are things everywhere on the rock. There are little things to hold, little holds, little holes to put your finger in, little ledges to put your toes in. There are things all over. That doesn't necessarily make it easy, but it makes it more approachable, more doable. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. And, and I unfortunately was only there for four days and then I moved on to Switzerland. And that was wonderful, too. But I loved the Dogo. I'd love to go back there. I would love to climb in Japan. When we lived in Japan, I wasn't a climber. I'd never heard of it. Uh, but now through my son, I know that there's really excellent climbing there. And I would love to go back. And, and you know, I lived there for four years. So it's kind of like feels like home. You know? Yeah. And I'd love to go back there and climb. And I'd love to go back to Greece and climb. Mm-hmm. Greek climbing is outstanding. Yeah, so there's a whole, my list is very long. <laughs> there's lots of things to do. Now, one of the right. questions I asked um, some of my listeners of what they might want to ask you, and somebody said, um, what about her fear of injuring herself during the climbs and impacting the rest of her life? How does she feel about that? Um, I don't, don't really do anything that dangerous or that, Risky risk risk. I mean, you can mitigate most of the risk in climbing. Yes, things do happen. Rocks do break, and you know, things unexpected happen. But and you can't do anything about those. But you can mitigate all the rest. And I, I'm a very climbing is far far safer than say mountain biking. Far safer. It's safer than surfing for sure. It's 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 a very safe sport if you do it that way. I mean, not if you're free soloing like my son, you know, extraordinary kind. But but on ropes with a partner, you know, with a player, it there's very little that can damage you. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, I always think about that. I want to live to see my grandkids grow up. You know, I have a brand new granddaughter, and I want to be around who, for a long time. One? Your uh, your daughter's my, my son. My son. My Alex, son. okay. Alex, yeah, had his first. So, um, yeah, I, I, we mitigate those risks as much as possible. Okay. Our goal, uh, a climb isn't over when you get to the top. A climb is only over when you get back down to the ground. And uh, that's always our goal. You know, me and my friends and me and, Al- and Alex, too. He's a very safe climber. Very, very safe. Yeah. So that means also that ties in with the next question, the fear of aging. Do you feel that getting older is stops you in any way i mean from what we heard so far it's like no yeah. that's already yeah. answered but i just wanted to put out that, there for the that is, no no that is such a non-issue we are taught we are told to fear aging that's our culture and it's so wrong there are so many cultures that don't teach us that um no we are we are taught that and it's mostly through uh, um, the pharmaceutical industry we are expected to take this drug for this, this drug to fall asleep, this drug to wake up, this drug to lose weight. This drug. None of that is necessary if you embrace Mother Nature and go out and do what your body is meant to do. None of that is necessary. I mean, yes, of course, there are illnesses. 
that require drugs. Yes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a normal person, a normal body. Um, it's just so sad what people will believe without thinking about it. I mean, there is taking drugs is not natural. Taking drugs, ingesting anything from a, from a, what do you call it? A bottle. Not a no, no, not a factory, but a, a laboratory. Ingesting anything made in a laboratory is not normal. It is not natural. And we shouldn't do it. And we know this, but advertisements hammer at us from birth till death. Oh, oh, if we have that screen on all the time. Mm -hmm. And most people do. And I, I'll never understand why people buy into that. Because you know, no, there's nothing to fear about aging if you keep doing stuff. Being but, active, that's what I always yes, say. Yes. Don't stop, sit on your tukas and do nothing. Yes, yes. if you sit and you know, watch TV and knit or whatever, or crochet like my mother used to do, um, you're not going to be in good, very good shape. There, you mm -hmm. can't be. You can't be. Yeah, that, that's just, just such a non-issue. Do I fear aging? Absolutely not. I embrace it. Aging is better than the alternative, not aging, right? <laughs> I mean, my, my husband died at 55. You know, there's a lesson in there. He just keeled over. Um, he was taking drugs for this, drugs for that, you know, that I didn't know about. But, um, but no, no, I do not fear aging. Aging is a natural, normal process, and we should all embrace it, and we should should keep doing stuff while we do. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's been like, you know, when you think at our ages, things will break down, like your foot. Of course, of course. I have my knee. I have to stop running marathons because my knee's right. not liking it, but I can do a whole bunch right. of other things. Exactly. You can change. You can adapt. You can adapt with your body. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's, you know, we were talking about climbing today. And uh, my daughter recently just started climbing again after back in the days we all climbed together. And okay. recently, she about a year ago, she's like, my mom, you got to come up and climb and, you know, bring I'm my husband now of 10 years, which I climbed before him. I was mm -hmm. like, we got to go. And he's like, oh, I'm too big. And I was like, no, no, you'll love it. Just like, big. Nobody's too big. <laughs> he's big okay. poor. And he, I was like, you, you're going to be great. You're going to be fine. But it's that just doing, and it's not about that we always have to succeed. And what I like about your story right. is that, um, that you are doing the research, you're doing the work to learn about what you're going to do next mm -hmm. instead of, just um, which is there's nothing wrong. I mean, I'm definitely happy that people hire me as their coach and show them how to do things. But it's mm -hmm. it's you can show somebody only so much. The right. rest the yeah. person has to do. It has to be up to them. Yeah. It, and that's what you're showing our audience, that this is the way to go and that anybody right. has time to do it and can do it if right. they put their mind to it. No, baby, baby steps is the is the answer to just about anything. I mean. You can do anything by tiny increments, baby steps. Did, 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 you must have listened to one of my podcasts because all I talk about is baby steps. <laughs> oh, no, no, I haven't. <laughs> oh, but it's true. No, this it's is true. my thing. It's like, and I did a little video of my granddaughter walking with her little walking cart thingy. And then, you know, she lets go, she goes down and she tries to get back up on the chair to go standing position. And I titled it, this is what baby steps looks like. You go a little bit, you right. fall you down, fall. you fall again, again. Yep. and then you get a little bit better and all mm -hmm. these. Now, if somebody is trying to figure out who they are, what they want to do, because that's what I oftentimes hear for the women that are in their 50s or 60s. It's like, so here I am, I'm an empty nester. Mm -hmm. And I've been a good mom and did all the kids stuff and whatnot. And I have not made time for right. me or uh, to find my own passion what would you tell one, one very simple way is journaling start writing in the journal five minutes a day it's all it takes and once once your brain and your hand and your mind catch on to it then it will expand to a lot more than five minutes a day but when you start with baby step you know five minutes a day journaling and the only the only rule about journaling is to not stop for those five minutes. Just keep writing, whether it's with a pen or on your computer or however you do it. 
but it has to involve your hands. Dictating doesn't do it. It's it's a different brain function totally. Um, so journaling is the journaling. A journal is the best shrink in the world. You have a very capable shrink at your fingertips, and that's all it takes, really. I mean, you, you, it it will be a, a surprise when you start. It will be a surprise what comes through. I mean, even if you're writing about your Aunt Tilly's recipe for fudge for five minutes, your mind in the background is thinking about your life. And you'll be amazed at what comes out in the journal. And that's the best way I know to explore who you are, what you want, and what you need. This is great. Just let it pour out. No censorship, right? Right, right, right. Exactly. This is amazing. So based on your... Yeah. But based on your life, based on what you've experienced, based on the things you've done and felt, what would you tell other women that are listening to the, to your podcast? And they're not necessarily a, a one a client, but what can they do in their life to move forward, as I like to call it, to to follow their dreams, to take life? Well, like the answer to that is endless. I mean, life is filled with adventure, filled with opportunities, all kinds of things go on in life. You need to find out about them. You need to, A, start journaling. What do I love? And, and a recommendation for that is go back to when you were five. What did you love then? Chances are you'll still love it. Um, you know, did you love climbing trees when you were a kid? Oh, maybe you're a climber. I did, you know. Did you love music when you were a kid? Maybe you should learn to play the piano. You know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever you loved when you were four and five and six, explore that. You know, that's the best way to start is to go back to your roots. You're a different person now than you were then. And you have learned a lot more and you have much more experience. And But the you that's inside is still you. And you need to reconnect with that. Mm -hmm. And the best way I know to do that is journaling. A good friend is also a good, uh, you know, a good outlet for that. But a journal is far more private and it's far more danger free. You know, there's no judging. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to say, oh, you shouldn't, you know, fill in the blank, whatever. Um, like friends can do, you know. And so a journal is like the ideal way to explore that. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I think you said it's private. Nobody judges you. Nobody says, oh, right. what do you think? And or you, th you you don't have to defend you write something that right. you think is right. stupid. Right. You don't have to say, oh, my God, they think I'm stupid. Right. right. Uh, when I was thinking about climbing El Cap, for example, I didn't tell anybody. I knew what they would have said because the people who I talked with at the college, they were always saying, but Jeffrey, you're crazy. You're going to get hurt. You're too old for this. You know, I would I would have had a lot of that. And I didn't need that. I needed encouragement. <laughs> And my son was very encouraging. So, yeah, it's it's a lengthy process. It can be. Or you could luck out and just find it right away in your journal or, or your, you know, whatever. But uh, you also uh, first uh, published your first book, The Sharp End of Life, A Mother's Story, which we haven't talked about today. Um, so she wrote a book and Deirdre probably started it by journaling. Yes, indeed, I did. Indeed, I did. Um, I delved, I dug back into all my old journals when I was writing that book. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we leave a link in the show notes for you guys so you can get your hands on the book and can purchase yeah. it. And uh, your documentary and, uh, will come out in... Uh -huh. Next year, 2023. Hmm? It'll be out in 2023. Yes. Ooh, I'll be on the lookout for that one. The trailer is out now. I think you can put the trailer address up on your thing um the trailer is beautiful she did a really nice job you know the, the filmmaker so uh, i'm assuming the film is going to be just as lovely i think i saw the trailer if i'm not mistaken is it on youtube uh on it's, on, it's on vimeo yes i think i saw that then yeah now Deirdre, yes. what what is one question that you wish somebody would ask you during an interview that nobody has asked you yet and I've done so many interviews that uh, that is one thing that pretty much pretty much hit on everything. Uh, I'll keep thinking about that. <laughs> good, because uh, you have had so many interviews, and I know I can imagine that there's something where you said, "Dag Nabbit, why didn't anybody ask me? Does anybody want to know about that?" 
So far, that has not happened, but I'll keep thinking about it. Keep thinking about it. So with finally, how can people reach you and find out more about you, connect with you and follow you? Um, Instagram is probably the easiest and the fastest is Deirdre underscore Wallenick underscore Honnold. Um, most of my um, previously published books and articles and essays and stuff are all under the name of Honnold because that was my married name. Mm-hmm. Um, so Deirdre Wallenick Honnold with underscores. That's uh, Instagram or just uh, my, my, if you want to get to know me and know what I'm about, read my blog. The blog is uh, at Deirdre W dot US. Very simple. DeirdreW.us and uh, you can read about all kinds of different topics. I, I write about whatever I'm thinking about that week or month or whatever. Um, so I hope to see you there. You can you can sign up so you can always get notices about the block notifications. Uh, so those are the best ways. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Deirdre. It was a pleasure getting to know you and chatting with you about your life and your adventures. You're welcome. And thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview and you will take advantage of all the links that we shared with you. And when the episode airs on Instagram or if you're on Facebook, um, also YouTube, where we also show the video because Deirdre showed us all the pictures that if you listen, you can see. Um, You can also watch the video that comes with the audio as a separate a separate piece but we want to know what you think about her story how it inspired you how it made you perhaps take the next step in your life and what that step may be so we do want to hear from you you will have all the links that we talked about today in the show notes so no need to panic and worry that you didn't quite get it while you're driving or doing whatever it is you're doing it will be there for you and i hope to see you next time here on the pursue your spark podcast Ciao. Bye-bye.